I live alone in a one bedroom apartment. So can anyone tell me why there's a woman sitting on my couch watching TV? I was in my room getting some work done when I had gotten a bit hungry and planned on walking to the kitchen for some leftover Chinese food. My kitchen sits right next to the living room and as soon as I stepped out into the dark hallway, I noticed the television was on. I know I never stopped to watch anything on it, so this was an immediate red flag. Thinking that maybe it was updating or maybe Alexa had switched it on by mistake, I walked over to turn it off. But my heart dropped when I saw a woman with oily black hair sitting on my couch watching it. For a moment, I was confused because I know there was no one here when I walked in and I knew all the doors and windows were locked. From the time I came home, I hadn't heard anyone break in. So how the hell could this person be sitting there? I wanted to walk forward and ask what the hell she was doing in my house, but something screamed that that would be a grave mistake. If anyone has experienced sleep paralysis, that was what the feeling was like. I told my body to move, but the primal part of my brain refused vehemently. I slowly crept back inside my room and just waited in silence. At this point, I know that you're already screaming at me to call the cops, and trust me, I wanted to. Nothing at that moment would have made me feel better than to have one or two armed police officers there to deal with her so that I wouldn't have to. But if I'm being honest, I didn't want her to hear me talking. If she had walked to my room, I'd be trapped. And at that moment, I felt like that would be a nightmare. After waiting a half an hour in silence, I mustered up enough courage to at least observe and see what she was up to. Forcing myself up, I cracked the door open, just enough to see a clear view of the hallway and look at where she was sitting. If I didn't know any better, I'd have thought that she had legitimately just stumbled into the wrong house and was relaxing like any normal person, but something was off. It almost looked like she was slumped forward on the couch. Part of me wanted to believe that she was sleeping, but what I saw next shattered any hope of that. She reached a distinguishedly long arm towards the door and unlocked it from her seated position with ease. I haven't measured yet, but eyeballing that distance from my couch to the door, it had to be at least eight to nine feet, and that's on the low end. She slowly stood up and made a clumsy effort to walk towards it. Her body was horrifying. She was tall uncomfortably so. If I had to guess, I'd say that she was maybe over nine feet, with arms that touched the ground and dragged behind her. Her hands each sported roughly eleven fingers that had to each be around a foot in length. From what I remember, she was completely naked with saggy skin that hung loosely off of her extremely thin body. She was paler than I thought was possible. Her skin appeared almost gray, and if I didn't know any better, I'd think that her skin belonged to someone recently deceased. She didn't move gracefully. She dragged her massive body towards the door and raised her arm towards the doorknob to pull it open. It's almost like she had to break her own bones to complete the movement. But as soon as she pulled the door open and moved her spiny legs outside, she stopped. My blood ran cold as she slowly turned her head towards me and I caught a glimpse of her face. I wanted to scream when I didn't see any eyes, just a puffy exterior with sagging eye holes and a mouth with long rubbery lips that dropped past her shoulders in a permanent look of anguish. I don't know if she saw me or if she even had the capability to. All I remember was her turning her head back outside and leaving my home. She shut the door behind her and I was left in silence with my heart pumping faster than it ever had. I rushed outside with my phone to see if I could catch her on the video, and I, I wish I hadn't. I wish I would just close the door and gone to sleep and try to pass the whole thing off like a fucked up nightmare. But what I saw, I know it was real. I looked outside in the cold dark, and I saw her hanging off the side of the building like a fucking spider. The window of the person above me was open. She was fishing inside, and after a few seconds of searching... She pulled out their son. Her hand was completely wrapped around his head, and I couldn't tell if he was alive or dead by the time she had slunk off into the darkness with a young boy. I caught it all on video. 
I must have watched it a hundred times before deleting it. I mean, what the fuck was I supposed to do with it? Do you think the police would believe it as a real piece of evidence? Even if they had, what the hell are they going to do? And as a parent, aren't you better off thinking that your kid ran away? Rather knowing it was taken by an entity that we can't even begin to comprehend. At least with the former, you can hope that maybe you'll see them again. I just couldn't bring myself to bring up such a crazy notion to a grieving family. Or worse, have them believe me and go looking for something that no one should ever try to find. I knew as long as I kept it, I'd be tempted to watch it. And every time I watched it, I'd be driven further into madness. There have been more stories of missing kids as of late. I've even heard some rumors of pets going missing from people's homes. Surprisingly enough, I even heard a story of a full-grown man disappearing. He has never been seen again with absolutely no trace of where he went or why he left. The only thing suggesting any kind of outside force was an open window. A few strands of hair police couldn't match DNA to. This has taken quite a toll on my life. I try to find info on this thing, but as far as I know, there's nothing. If anyone out there has a similar experience, please tell me your story and share the images of the thing, if you have them. I just want to know I'm not crazy. I'm quitting my job tomorrow and staying with my brother on the other side of the country. There's no fucking way I'm sticking around that thing more than I need to. I don't plan on being here much longer. But last night, I heard knocking on my door. I know the next time I see it, I won't be telling a story afterward. But I also know, I'm burning the whole damn apartment down with me. My mom was on a routine night shift at the hospital, and I knew I wouldn't see her until the next morning. Probably in a deep sleep on her bed, like still in her uniform. I always made her breakfast before I would leave for school in the morning so that she could wake up to a nice meal. I use the word nice loosely. It's the best I could do considering I'm 16 and failed home economics class last year. But my mom never minded toast, scrambled eggs, and turkey bacon platter left on her nightstand. We had said our goodbyes around 10.15 p.m. and I got myself comfortable on the couch with my dog to watch some TV. I turned the lights off over us to set the scene and make it feel more immersive. I got through one Dateline episode when I decided that I could enjoy the experience a little bit more if I grabbed my bong. So I went upstairs and down the long, narrow hallway that led to my wing of the house. I was the only occupied room on that side of the house. The other rooms were my dad's old office and guest room. Though that room hasn't had a guest in years. Ever since my dad's passing, my mom and I haven't wanted to host other people here. Instead, it hosts the overload of clutter I find at the end of every school year. Clothes that I no longer want and plan on selling or donating. Paintings I worked months on but never hung up. And other miscellaneous items that aren't used but can't seem to be let go of either. I opened my bedroom door and grabbed the piece off my nightstand. It was almost a sculpture rather than a cheesy bong you might imagine when thinking of a stoner. It was about 16 inches tall and made completely out of this blue, hand-blown glass that resembled the color the ocean looks like after a series of rough waves. The glass swirled in an upward motion towards the mouthpiece that made it look like it was water, frozen in time. My favorite feature of this prized possession is its ability to glow in the dark. After letting it sit in the sun for a little bit, flakes of the glass would glow a bright green at night. I walked back down the hallway with it, then back down the stairs until I was sitting down on the couch next to my dog, Pepe. He was sound asleep as I started to grind up the green, sticky plant matter, which was generally what the name was, plant matter. It was a new strain I had just bought from my regular plug from the next town over. He had told me he had just recently got a limited supply of this stuff and asked me if I could be one of his test subjects to see if he should buy more. Without hesitation, I agreed. Discounted weed just to give feedback? I'd be a fool not to take the offer. So I did. Holding it in my hand, I saw multiple colors reflecting off the crystals. It's common to see colors like purple and orange, but this stuff had shades of red 
blue and pink. Odd, I thought, but I was taken over by more intrigue than suspicion. So I continued to put the stuff in the bowl and pack it down with my lighter. After the first inhale, I got a taste of ordinary weed, but soon followed by a slight trace of citrus. It was pleasant. I was paying extra attention to the experience so I could give a good detailed report back to the plug like he had asked. About 15 minutes went by. Dateline was still playing and the specific episode seemed to be extra interesting to me in my new hazy state. The cushions beneath me started to almost mold to my body. I felt like I was sinking yet my weight was light as a feather at the same time. My eyes started to get dry and trying to keep them open became a task more so than a natural ability at this point. As I slowly started to move my eyes behind my lids, I realized that I had fallen asleep. It must have been quite a while because it felt so sluggish, like it used all my strength within me just to be able to keep my eyes fully open. The light above the living room was still off, like I had left them, but all the others downstairs were too. Something I had not done. It was now pitch black everywhere except the surrounding area where the light emitting from the TV could reach, which was not very far. The second thing I noticed was what sent a chill running through my whole body and caused my heart to stop momentarily. I was paralyzed. I was physically unable to move any part of my body other than my eyes, tips of my fingers, and toes. I was only able to produce slight twitches, but it took so much strength out of me to do so. So there I was, almost completely paralyzed, unable to move or scream for help while the TV continued the program like I was still an attentive, consenting viewer. Pepe was still soundly asleep beside me, blissfully unaware of the living hell I was experiencing, just inches away from his sleepy head. I tried reaching for him. Maybe he would wake up and sense my distress and... And then what? I thought to myself. What the hell could happen next that would possibly help me in this situation? The answer was nothing. I felt as though Keith Morrison was now mocking me and the couch cushions below me that once felt made for me were now stiff and cold, as if every fiber in the fabric was rejecting contact with my body. I reasonably started to panic, not because the realization of my situation was setting in, but because I heard a creak from upstairs. I knew this house like the back of my hand. It's the only house I had ever lived in. So I knew each floorboard had its own distinct creak, and this one, this one I recognized at the top of the stairs. Someone was in my home, and they were standing on top of the staircase that led directly to the room I was in. Each crack that followed the last made my eyes water. The fear I felt distort each sound to resemble what I imagined a rib being snapped in half would make. Hearing the footsteps slowly descend the stairs made my stomach turn and my body writhe in pain from the inside out. Staring at the one visible stair from the position on the couch made me want to retreat backwards and find security in the couch. I did not want to see the intruder, the person that would be able to have their way with me in such a vulnerable state, but I couldn't rip my eyes from that stair. I knew the danger was coming, but I just couldn't look away. If someone was going to do whatever evil they intended, I was going to see them approaching, whether or not I truly wanted to. Seconds felt like minutes. My heart raced so fast that each beat felt moments apart. I was dripping in sweat, even though my body couldn't move. The sound of the TV gradually faded away and was replaced by a long, piercing ringing in its place. The creaks that belonged to the stairs near me echoed as the unidentified subject's weight pressed down on them. Through the dim light, I could make out what seemed to be a shadow hand gripping the side of the wall that obstructed my view from the stairs and the person on them. What broke the moment of silence was a faint, muffled scream coming from the back of my throat. It was the only amount of sound I could muster up in my frozen state. I was a deer in headlights, the perfect victim for any predator. It was hard to say whether I was still paralyzed or was the sheer terror I felt at the moment that was responsible for my immobilization. The hand methodically lifted its fingers and slowly tapped each one of them back down creating a sickening drumming sound. Once, then twice, 
then three times the lone hand strummed before the rest of its body became slightly illuminated when it moved to the last and final stair. As the entire form was revealed, my wide eyes trailed up to about eight feet in the air. It was gigantic. Its arms were as long as its height, and the creature's face and mouth were stretched from side to side. It wore a gut-wrenching expression that can only be described as a smile due to the fact that it had no teeth. Just a huge mouth stretched agape with bleeding gums that dripped down to my wood floors. To me, it was an indication that this was not a figment of my imagination, but a real, dangerous threat, and I needed to step into action immediately. The thing let me soak in its disgusting appearance fully, so that its next performance was all the more terrifying. It produced a series of gruntle, hard sounds that I could only describe as its laugh. It witnessed me using every ounce of energy I had in my body to cry out or move, finding amusement in my distress. All I could do was cry silently. My eyes streamed with tears while I stared unblinking at the creature that slowly approached me like a lion would with their wounded prey. It was only feet away now. Its long arms dangled behind its moving legs, dragging along the floor still drumming its fingers to a nightmarish beat. The creature moved at a slow pace, taking advantage of my paralysis. It knew that dragging out this hellish scene would make the kill all that more satisfying for its demented desire. At this short distance, I was able to see the face fully illuminated now, and it was awful. Still smiling with red gums, its eyes were wide as its anatomy allowed, and their gaze never left mine. It had a nose, but it was just two holes that looked like they were hand-poked by whatever created this god-awful being. It was almost as if it was human, but the devil seemed to have poisoned this one. It was now close enough to smell my fear, and to see the glint of hope for survival fading in my eyes. I had to do something, anything that would make me feel like I at least tried to fight for my life. That's when I saw it in the corner of my eye, a faint green glow inches away from my frozen hand, my bong. Amongst the chaos, I had forgotten about it, but something within me screamed at me to try to move again, so I did. I focused all my energy towards moving my hand to grab my newly concealed weapon, and by luck, only created by miracle, it worked. I was able to grab it, and within moments I had swung the thick glass over the creature's head again and again. Its blood wasn't red, like the color dripping from its toothless smile. Instead, it was a dark black. A tar-like goo was everywhere. I felt it hit my face, go into my mouth. I saw it cover the couch, floors, and the walls. The scene was brutal. The once terrifying creature was now smashed and bent in a multitude of ways. Now left somewhere between the state of solid and liquid, its face was no longer distinguishable from the other battered parts of its body and I smiled. I smiled now that the thing no longer had his. I stood over its body with a mix of shock, adrenaline, and morbid joy that I almost laughed if it were for not my intense panting. I could not stop breathing, gasping for air, as a rush of blood flowed through my brain. I woke up to the comforting feeling of my bed sheets and pillow under my head. The relief that it was all a dream showered my body as I slowly opened my eyes and went to stretch out my limbs, but I couldn't. My arms were prevented from moving any further than my hips. The sound of metal hitting against itself brought it my attention to handcuffs around my wrist that were connected to the bed rails. Then the slow continuous beeping that was once hidden in the background got drawn forward. As I began to scan my surroundings, I was in the hospital room, still covered in that sticky, metallic smelling substance though it was not the deep black that I, I previously witnessed, but crimson red. The unfamiliar voice of a man brought me to the present, and out of the fog. Miss, the officer started in a low and careful tone. Do you remember anything from last night? The question made my face turn in an almost offended expression. After a second of recollection, of course I did. I don't think I would be able to scratch that disgusting smile out of my memory. That immense fear I felt can still be there if I close my eyes. 
Uh, yes. It was the first time I heard my own voice in hours. There was this thing. The officer gave an unamused look at his colleague as he let out a deep breath and laid a stack of images on my lap. My mother laid violently killed on our living room floor. If it wasn't for her nursing uniform, I wouldn't have been able to tell that it was even a human due to the unnatural state of autonomy she was left in. Before I was even able to process what the officer was insinuating, I screamed. I screamed so loud that I felt my dry vocal cords rubbing against each other and let out a flood of tears that assisted the sobs of confusion, sadness, and anger. Out of my harsh cries, I recognized a haunting familiar sound. I looked to see the officer drumming his fingers on his notepad and watched as his mouth started to stretch into a distinct, disgusting, and unforgettable toothless smile. Before my divorce, I thought being home alone was so relaxing, so freeing, a moment in which I didn't need to worry about anyone but me, and if I laid on the couch the whole time and left the dirty dishes in the sink till later, there's no one to criticize me. After my divorce, when the kids were at their dad's house, it just felt lonely. Not all the time. Sometimes it was really nice to eat chips and do nothing, or take an hour-long bath with a bath bomb and a good book. But today, I was feeling lonely. I needed friends. Part of my bedroom routine is to go around the house and pick up any last dishes and trash as I turn the lights off. The dogs normally walk around with me, but tonight, they were in the backyard and hadn't been quite ready to come in. As I reached my son's bedroom and reached for the light switch, I frowned. I thought I already turned this one off. Maybe I was just more tired than I thought. I flicked the switch, picked up a plate off the bed, and moved on. After I convinced my dogs to come in, I made my way to my own bedroom. My son's light was on. I had turned it off, didn't I? My husky, Chloe, stood next to me at this time. Ears back flat, a low growl sounded from her throat. I quietly made my way to my bedroom and grabbed my phone and my gun. 911 keyed in, ready to hit the call button. Chloe and I walked through the room, joined by my lab, Max. I checked under the bed as they sniffed corners. We checked the closet together. Nothing. No one. I checked the windows. Still locked. Chloe relaxed as we walked back out of the room. I flicked off the light. I walked through the rest of the house with both dogs by my side. It's a small enough house. Three bedrooms. But barely. No basement. No attic. My skin prickled with goosebumps. I made sure that the doors and windows were all locked. Maybe I'm losing my mind. Maybe there was an electrical issue. I would call an electrician if it happened again. I brought the dogs into my bedroom and shut and locked the door. Phone plugged in nearby. Gun went in the bedside table drawer. Normally I lock it in the safe. I swear I'm a responsible gun owner, but the light thing had me on edge. And my kids weren't there. I'd felt both relief and loneliness at being home alone before, some anger at my ex for putting me in this position. Fear was new. I didn't like it much. As I was laying in bed, I reassured myself that it was just me being silly. The doors and windows were still locked, and I had two dogs that barked if anyone so much as walked past our house. If someone was here, I would know. I needed more sleep. That's why I must have forgot to turn off the light, twice. I fell asleep with my face towards the door. I woke up to my dogs barking. It took one groggly second to realize that my bedroom door was open. It was still dark through the window, but light streamed through the open door. I had 911 dialed before I formed the next full thought and fumbled in my drawer for my gun. My heart stopped as I emerged from the bedroom to find every light in the house on. I was sobbing on my neighbor's porch when the police car pulled up minutes later. My dog barked from behind the front door as she did her best to comfort me with a blanket and a cup of tea. 
They searched the house, but didn't find anyone. As kindly as they could, they asked me if I was on any medication or if I'd been drinking. I wasn't, and a glass of wine didn't make me sleepwalk around the house and turn every light on. They cleared me to go back in, but my neighbor offered to let me sleep in her spare room if I wanted to, and I took her up on it. When I went back the next morning, it was with a heart that beat too quickly and with dogs who could sense my nerves. We re-inspected every part of the house, but everything seemed fine. The lights were still on, probably left that way by the police though. It was fine. I checked every inch of the house, made sure all the doors and windows were locked, and sat on the couch trying to decide what to do next. I got a locksmith. It was more expensive than I would have liked, especially asking them to get there that day. But rekeying all the doors seemed like a good idea given that someone entered my house and my locked bedroom door. I'm shivering thinking about it. I had one more night alone in this house till next weekend. I wasn't sure if I felt worse about being alone or the possibility of someone trying this when my kids were here. I decided it was better if I was alone for it. I couldn't imagine the added terror of someone breaking in with my kids. When bedtime came, I was methodical, room by room, starting from the furthest point, turning off all the lights. I made my way into my room and glanced back down the hall. The kitchen light was on. I had started in the kitchen. Gun gripped in my hand. I took a step down the hall. The light flipped off. I screamed, locked myself in my bedroom and called the police. I spent the night at my neighbor's again. I called my ex-husband and explained the situation. I asked if the kids could stay with him while I figure out what's happening and he agreed. In the morning, I called the alarm company, another expense I didn't need. They put sensors on each of the windows and helped me install cameras in the front and back door. If someone triggered an alarm and I didn't punch in the code, they would send someone out. At least if whoever was messing with me tried something, the psycho would be caught. That night, no lights were turned on as I made my way to bed. I barely slept waking up from a dream of someone standing over me several times. I walked out of my bedroom, and the lights were on. I called the police who checked the house for a third time in as many days, and they told me they couldn't find anyone. The sensors hadn't been triggered, and there was no one on camera when I watched them. Was I doing this? Maybe I was sleepwalking. Stress could make you do that, couldn't it? That night, I triple checked everything. The dog slept in my room with the door locked. I awoke to glass shattering. My bedroom door was open. Dogs nowhere in sight. Light flooded through the door. I ran to my kitchen and stopped short of stepping in. The floor was covered in glass. My cabinets were all open. Every single glass, plate, and bowl were on my floor in pieces. I was on the phone with a dispatcher as I looked around frantically for my dogs. I heard Chloe bark and peered out the window into the dark. They were outside. After the police showed up for the fourth night in a row, I cried myself back to sleep in my neighbor's spare bedroom. In the morning, she helped me clean up the glass and we sat down to watch the security footage together. I wasn't sure how whatever was doing this had gotten in now that I had changed all the locks and secured the windows, but surely they couldn't avoid the cameras as they lured my dogs out of the house. And yet, there was no one. We went through the footage for both the front and back door. No one comes anywhere near my front door. We slowed down frame by frame when we got to the point that the dogs went outside. The back door opens, lights already on. Chloe appears at the doorway, head cocked, Her eyes are up as if she's paying attention to something, but she doesn't appear nervous or frightened. Max walks up next to her and appears to jump up as if it's greeting someone. Then both dogs run outside. After a minute, the back door closes again. I need to move. I need to move now. I can't live here anymore. My neighbor helped me pack. 
It was a haphazard rush job. I stayed with her for the next few nights and only packed during the day. Each morning when I came in, all the lights were on. Boxes would be overturned. I got a nice apartment, similar living space size really, even if there's no backyard. I started moving the boxes in at the end of every day. I was relieved when everything was moved in. I'd been in my new apartment for a week, and today, when I woke up, all my lights were on. Growing up, my parents told me to never go into the basement. It's kind of interesting now that I think back on it. I was an obedient kid and never did anything my parents told me not to. But I also never once questioned, until very recently, why I wasn't allowed to go down those stairs. Our house was huge. My dad worked in finance, but grew up as a country boy before college. So as soon as he had the chance, he moved us out into isolation, even though this made the commute over an hour and a half into town. I loved it, especially when I was younger because we had a lot of animals on our property, some wild, and some actually owned by my parents. My mom would stay home and take care of the chickens and the geese while I watched and played with them. My mom always told me not to get too close with these animals because we would sell some of them from time to time and she didn't want my feelings to get hurt. I did my best to follow her instructions, but I have to admit, there are definitely some animals I missed when they got sold off. I spent many evenings after a long bus ride home from school, sitting out back with the animals, watching the sun go down over the wide open fields. It was more peaceful than words could describe. But out of anywhere on the acres and acres of property, the only place I wasn't allowed to be was that basement. I once tried to walk down with my mom. She went downstairs to do the laundry. I offered to hold the blankets and dirty clothes for her as she went down the steps thinking that she would definitely appreciate the help, but I was terribly wrong. As soon as my foot hit the top step behind her and before I could squeak out my offer to assist her, she turned around to push me back using the laundry basket. Not a hard push, but enough of one to force me back through the door into the kitchen. What have I told you? She said to me. What have I said about coming down here? I apologized and hung my head, feeling like a bad kid. She could sense that and patted me on the head. It's okay, she said. Just don't do it again, okay? You need to stay up here. Why don't you go see if any of the chickens had laid their eggs? I forgot to go out there this morning and would love the help. I smiled and agreed to do it. Walking out the back kitchen door towards the coop, my mom closing the basement door behind her before I even made it outside. The weather was terrible a few winters ago. We were pummeled with snow, and unfortunately, a lot of our animals died on the farm. Don't get me wrong, we did okay in everything. Again, farming was more of a hobby than a means of income, but I was pretty upset by the animals no longer being there. For some reason, my parents got jittery and seemed to be more and more out of character the longer that we were stuck in the house. We had plenty of food, and power hadn't gone out. I couldn't figure out what they were freaking out over. Besides being stuck and not being able to go outside. There was a knock at the door a week or two before the snowstorm. And I remember how strange it was that we would have a visitor. We would never have visitors. We're pretty far out in the sticks and people don't just swing by or anything. Especially without letting us know first. My dad answered the door and there's a young man lacking all color and covered head to toe in white thick snow. He thanked my father graciously for opening the door and explained his situation. His car had broken down about six or seven miles up the road and he didn't know where to go. He didn't have a cell phone and he was traveling across country so he didn't know who to contact anyway. My father invited him in and all of a sudden the jittery sense of my parents started to float away. They seemed more calm now that the stranger was in the house and it was such an odd situation that I just had to sit back and watch. I listened to the man tell us that he didn't have any family living, except a sister that he hadn't spoken to in years, and that he was on his way to Boston to start fresh. 
He said that his mother had passed only a few months prior and pulled out a teeny gold locket on a chain. He told us it belonged to her and that it was the only thing he had left of her. I smiled and nodded at him, still not saying a word. After we spoke for a few minutes, my parents realized some of the snow covering his clothes was melting and everything he had on was soaked. My mother looked at my father and said to the man, Would you like to change? You and my husband seem to be the same size. You could borrow some of his clothing for now. My father nodding along. The stranger stood and shook my father's hand, thanking him over and over again, while my mom led him towards the kitchen. Our laundry room is right this way. I'm sure I could find you something. She opened the basement door and gestured the man towards it. Without hesitation, he started down the wooden steps. My father came to me and told me to go upstairs and get ready for dinner. I said okay and walked up the large staircase, not even thinking twice about the request. When I came downstairs, my mom and dad were sitting at the table. I asked if the stranger would be joining us, but without even looking up at me, they said that he had left. I didn't know what to say to that because he had almost frozen to death just getting to the house and the closest town wasn't for miles and miles. There was no way he would make it back. My parents told me to have a seat, and dinner went along like nothing happened. But I finally got curious. This man couldn't have just appeared into thin air. I had to know what was going on in the basement. I had to know if he ever came back up. I was young, but not stupid. I knew something was wrong. That night, after my parents had gone to bed, I grabbed the flashlight from my drawer and started downstairs towards the kitchen. The floors creaked, so I had to take my time, making sure that I didn't wake up my parents in the process. When I finally touched the tile of the kitchen, a small wave of relief came over me and I took a break to steady my breathing, seeing as how I had been holding my breath as I moved across the hardwood. I finally reached the knob on the basement door checked around me one last time, and opened the door with a creak. I placed my foot on the top step, which felt much older than the stairs. The air as I headed down smelled sweet, but a foul kind of sweet. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. I came downstairs to the concrete floor and listened the best I could. Silence. Nothing. I flashed the light around to see the washer and dryer, just as I expected, and some boxes of what I remember to be old clothes and such, but nothing really out of the ordinary. I was turning to head back up the stairs, now feeling silly and actually pretty sour with myself for not listening to my parents when something shiny caught my eye. I turned my flashlight on it and walked over where it lied on the floor. It was the golden locket the stranger had shown us, from his mother. I picked it up and leaned myself against the wall to examine it further when the wall started to move with my shifting weight. I jumped back, frightened, and shined my flashlight on the wall, realizing that it was, in fact, fake. Being the curious kid I was and still clutching the locket, I moved the wooden portion of the wall out of the way, revealing a shallow hole. What I saw in there is something that changed my life forever. Inside the hole sat a crate. The thing looked like a human, like a boy, but quite different. His limbs were much longer than a regular person, widely disproportionate from his body. At the end of each arm were bony fingers with sharp claws. Its eyes were pitch black with no pupils. It was a hairless beast and its ears were simply torn holes in the side of its head. The mouth stretched across its face into a large sharp tooth grin. It had no clothing besides a small cloth covering its lower abdomen. Around its neck was a thick chain that was attached to the concrete wall. It startled me, smearing what looked like blood across its wrinkled face, smiling. My foot hit something and I looked down briefly, trying not to take my eyes off the beast or creature or whatever it was. A hand. Too afraid to scream, I turned around and started running towards the stairs. I only took about three to four steps before crashing into my parents, who stood over me with their arms crossed, shaking their heads. 
My dad put his arms around my shoulder and led me up the stairs into the living room while my mom covered up the hole. The chickens and animals that I missed were never sold. My dad didn't grow up on a farm or like living in isolation, but felt as though we had to. We had no neighbors for a reason. It was planned that way. Our whole lives up to this point, even now years later, have revolved around my older brother in the basement and keeping him fed.